I say these words in the name of the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Ooh, that's a loud microphone. So today is Mother's Day. Soon it's going to be Father's Day and then Grandparents' Day. You know, I wondered if there's an Aunt's and Uncle's Day or a Best Friend's Day or a Keeper of Secrets Day, days to honor those who carry all the many different roles in our lives, mothering being just one of those. You know, we all play different roles in others in our, for others in our lives. Before I was a mother, which was been for a long time, I'm afraid, I was an aunt to my sister's children. And I will never forget the first time I babysat overnight for my two-year-old niece. Now, I had never even babysat other children, so here I was with the two-year-old, and I bathed her, and that went well, and then I plopped her on the countertop of my bathroom vanity, and I powdered her with the only powder I had, which was uh, St. Loren powder, that's all I had. <laughs> and then I dried her hair and I put her to bed. Well, I called my sister to tell her just how well Kelly had behaved and had not caused a fuss at all. And she said, I told her, I, she stayed so still as I blow dried her hair. She said, Terry, she's two. She's never had her hair blow dried before in her whole life. I thought, well, no wonder she sat there so still, probably frightened to death. You know, as people, we carry on different roles in others' lives, and we help people and ourselves to think things out. Maybe we think about how to love them, and gosh, sometimes to even like them, right? And how to serve them, and, and sometimes that means listening to them and asking or listening to their stories, which is a, an important part of shepherding others. Well, today we continue the Gospel of John's story of Jesus as the Good Shepherd, and I've put my icon that I did, one of the very first ones, of Jesus as the Good Shepherd. In chapter 10 from our reading today, Jesus is still on the path to the cross, and he continues to find himself harangued by both Jews and Romans to prove who he is. And we heard John read this morning in the Gospel, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, then tell us plainly. They said after accosting him in the temple. And can't you hear, or didn't you hear the exasperation in Jesus' voice as he said, I've told you and you still don't believe. I've told you who I am. I've even shown you who I am. And yet you still ask me these questions instead of listening to me and learning from what I have to say. But, he says, my sheep, my sheep know me and they will follow me. All of our readings today echo this wonderful metaphor of Christ being the Good Shepherd, and that if we listen and if we believe, then we will walk through this life without fear, for we know what God has promised, and we have faith in that promise. But we know many who don't, many who still question, many who still don't hear, many who are blind to the evidence that is right there before them. And many, well, maybe they have good reason to do that. And these are the ones who need shepherding the most. Just like Will, and even Dr. Sean McGuire in the movie, Good Will Hunting. The movie is set in the south end of Boston, which is a pretty rough area that resides right alongside one of the most elite colleges in the world, Massachusetts Technical Institute, or MIT. The main character, Will, is a 20-year-old product of an abusive foster home who has found his way of coping by never allowing himself to be vulnerable, never allowing himself to love or to be loved, except in a crass kind of way with his three best friends as only 20-year-old boys can do. Will has a gift for numbers and he's able to solve mathematical formulas in hours, formulas that have taken some of the more studied professors years to do. His photographic memory allows him to remember anything that he reads with a flip of the page. But he chooses the loyalty and the comfort of his friends over the possibility of having a different life, a life that opens doors to his taking risks, a possibility that he just cannot open himself to. And so one day, finding himself in jail for getting into trouble one too many times and not being able to outfox the judge as he had in the past, he is put in jail. But he is given a way out. And that way out is if he agrees to work with a brilliant MIT math professor who has discovered Will's gifts. And he's also 
required to go into therapy to help him with his obvious anger issues. So after, again, quickly outsmarting two of the MIT psychologists, Will finds himself in the hands of an empathetic shrink who identifies with Will's blue-collar roots. It takes time, but Dr. Sean is finally able to get Will to open up, not about his past experiences yet, but about life in general, and so that he is able then to listen to what the doctor has to say. And Sean knows that he cannot force Will to follow the path that most, most feel are best for him. He realizes that he can only help him see the benefits of the opportunities that he has to make his life better. And he does this by shepherding this troubled boy, guiding him to realize that many of the bad things that, he, that has happened to him were not his fault. And if you've seen the movie, you remember he kept saying, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. And that there is a way out of the life that he has limited himself to. And in doing so, Sean realizes that he too needs to find his own path to a happier, more fulfilling life. In other words, as is so often the case, they help each other. They help each other to be open to the possibility of a more authentic life by allowing others to love them, and even more importantly, allowing them to love themselves. And like Will, now so many people find themselves stuck in a miserable life or in turmoil, thinking that there is no way out, and nothing more fulfilling than what they have allowed themselves to think that they deserve. I'm going to let that sink in a moment. And there are Sean's, Dr. Sean's, the wounded healers, who do know the way out. These two characters in this movie, well, they could be you or me, and our friends and our family members, our acquaintances, and certainly strangers, sometimes stuck, other times the shepherds for those who have lost their way, they have wandered off the path that God has set for them, whether by their own choices or because of circumstances of life. Our reading from Revelation refers to those who have found their way out and who have survived the great ordeal, robed in white, washed in the blood of the Lamb, as it states in verse 14. They've made their way out of the tribulations of their lives. The Greek word for tribulation is thilthus, which means suffering, discomfort, hardship, and affliction. This word is found 45 times in the New Testament. Its root word is syllabo, which means to crush or to press together, to squash, to hem in or compress. How many of us have found ourselves in this kind of tribulation? The author of Revelation then is not referring to small hardships of life, but to times that put great pressure on us and therefore on our faith. You know, Will, he had all of his confidence in every bit of his ability to love squeezed out of him at the hand of his abusive caretakers and just the consequences of his life. And Dr. Sean, well, he had lost his wife, the great love of his life, he said, to cancer. And so both needed to find their way out of their own great ordeals. But here is the good news. We know there's always good news, because we know the way out. And we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit then to share this gift with others, to show them the way forward, to point them to the path. We cannot drag or force them to that place any more than the doctor could force Will, but we can tell them that they are not alone. We can tell them about our own experiences of listening for our shepherd's voice to be the sound of freedom and of hope, that we too have survived the great ordeals of life and have come out with our faith still intact. And we can say that it was our faith in knowing that God was with us, it was even in the suffering that helped us make it through and to help us endure, that the peace of God which passes all understanding, can and does give us the strength to know that this too shall pass. In this time of Eastertide, during the 50 days after Easter, as we await Pentecost and the breath of God 
to be breathed upon all of this. We're called to continue the ministry of Jesus and his apostles and his disciples. We are called to continue to be the body of Christ to the world that is torn by war and hatred and disillusionment. And we may be squeezed with the pressures of life's situations, beaten up by the fear that we, that we hear every day on the news. But we too, we know we will come out on the other side with our faith intact so we can help others who have not yet heard the shepherd's call or maybe who have forgotten what that voice sounds like so that they can find their way back into the loving, forgiving arms of Christ. In our last vestry meeting last week, I'd shared something that Reverend Delmer Chilton, what a name, <laughs> he works with, um, he does sermon prep for the lectionary lab, and he's one of the two Bubbas. I talk about them often, two Bubbas and a Bible. And this is what he said about church and its mission, so I can't take credit for this, I thought, wonderful metaphor. He said that the church is like a hostel. And if you've traveled in Europe, you understand that a hostel is a place for people often at a discounted price, if not free, to stay. It's a hostel. It's a place of refuge for those on their own journeys. It's a place where folks can come and rest and be refreshed and be fed. And maybe they will stay for a day, for a month, for a few years, or maybe they may find themselves filled and ready to continue on their journey. And so I say that we are here to heal and to feed and to care for all of those pilgrims who walk through the doors of this church. We are here to heal and feed and care for all pilgrims outside of these walls. We're here to help shepherd those who are lost to a better path. And we're here as the body of Christ to be a verbal witness to God's love for all that he created to witness to the world by demonstrating trust in God as our shepherd, as continuing to trust no matter how that unfolds. For the Lord is our shepherd, and so we shall not want. He revives our soul and he guides us along the right path. We will fear no evil, for he is with us. He comforts us. Surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen.